Paying the right price for property is high on everyone's agenda, but it is so hard when the market is hot. How do you get it right so that you don't keep missing out, but avoid paying way too much? Welcome to Your First Home Buyer Guide, the podcast for first home buyers who want to get it right. I'm Megan and that was Veronica. We're both buyers agents and probably old enough to be your mums. But that's a good thing because between us, we've got over 40 years experience and we are going to share with you bucket loads of stories about avoidable mistakes. Together, we're going to make sure that you get unbiased and real information that you can rely on so you can get where you want to be without missing a step. Now, we've got loads of great tips for you in this episode. And if you'd like more useful tools, head over to the website, homebuyeracademy.com.au. There you'll find free checklists that you can download, a free mini course on how to price a property and our where to buy workshop for only $39. Priceless stuff, really. Bargain. But before we get into the interesting stuff in this week's episode, here's the boring bit, the disclaimer. You of course know that nothing in this podcast is to be taken as personal advice. We always recommend getting the advice of an expert in their field of expertise. Now we've done our very best to ensure that the content is correct at the time of recording, but things change. So check with the relevant government authority or your advisors to get the most up-to-date information. Today, we're talking about one of the hardest (laughs) parts of buying your first place, in fact, any place, okay? How to work out what to pay. Right now, we're in a very hot market. There are so many buyers and not enough properties to go around, so prices are rising rapidly. But sometimes it is reverse. Too many properties and not enough buyers, and that can lead to falling prices. When you are working out what to pay, you need to have a really good idea about which way the market's going and how quickly it's moving. Otherwise, you could end up paying way too much or you're constantly missing out just because you're not actually offering enough. I'm hearing this over and over at the moment, Veronica. So we're, we're sitting in June 2021. We've had a rapidly rising market. People keep missing out, but they're fearful of paying too much. You know, there's, there is a way that you can kind of get a, get a bit of an idea, but let's have a look at what methods people use when they're trying to work out what to pay because... I don't know. I, I had a little bit of a laugh putting this um, this together, having a think about what people do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, look, you know, <laughs> some some methods are good, and some perhaps need a little bit of work. But you know, the old dartboard is a classic. We've got that free course that we we offer for people who can who can work out how to price a property, and we talk about the dartboard and the dartboard being, oh, I don't know. I guess I'll just pay this. See how I go. Not kind of based on anything. It's just it's like throwing a dart at a dartboard if you haven't had any practice and seeing if it hits anything or not. I can't tell you the amount of times I ask people, how did you <laughs> arrive at that price you're offered or you're prepared to pay? And they look at me blankly and then they're a bit embarrassed. They go, well, well not, it wasn't very really scientific. <laughs> um, you know, and, and these are people that either are about to become yeah. clients or are uh, considering using a buyer's obviously agent. So intelligent obviously intelligent too. In Obvi- yeah. and intelligent. They're smart enough to be able to afford to or to get the income to be able to afford to Probably buy the very property. very good at their but, jobs too. And they very good. And then they know, they actually know when they're asked that, oh, dear, that's that doesn't sound very smart, <laughs> does it? And I'm like, no, it doesn't well, you don't sound know very what you smart, don't know. but it's very, yeah, very you common. Know what you don't know. And another <laughs> way that some people arrive at, at what to pay is to kind of use the agent's price guide if there is one and go, oh, okay, well, if it's got an asking price, I'll just offer, you know, 20,000 or 10% below that. Or if there's a price guide, then, you know, maybe I have to pay 10% more than that. Or, um, you know, that price guide and, you know, auction properties are a classic. You talk about, you know, in, in Queensland, you can't have a price guide, but in New South Wales and Victoria, you can. Now, in a very recent episode, we did cover auctions and we did talk about price guides and the variance between, you know, one agent to another. But what we are finding definitely in a rising market, so there's that sort of blanket thing that people think, oh, I just add 10% or I just add 100 grand, whatever. So it's like, oh, it doesn't really work that way all the time. Sometimes yes, sometimes not. And it's not enough for you to be right and to use that Mm -hmm. as your measuring stick. 
But, you know, I've had agents coming to me in this hot market saying, oh, a buyer's adding 20% now. I'm going to have to start underquoting by 20%. And you know what? I worked out the average. I've been working out the average underquoting uh, in our core area in Sydney. Mm -hmm. This year it's been rising. In May the average was 28%. So can we talk about what that actually means? Because that's not necessarily, mm. we've got to kind of sort out the difference between what an yes. agent has told an owner a property is likely to sell for, and that may be within the, it should be within the quoted range versus what yep. people are prepared to pay that push it above the quoted range. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing is with a, with a price guide, and obviously you can't give them in Queensland, but you mm. can everywhere else. And, you know, the agent gives a price guide. It, it is legislated. It's meant to be within the range that they've told the owner. And that's to the expect. reserve. That's but the, the reserve, reality right? Is not necessarily. Not necessarily. The reserve could be a lot higher. And, and once again, the legislation around that changes from state to state. So it, it's complicated. But even if you look at one state, say you look at Melbourne, auction you know they've all got a rules that they go by that they have to fulfill but they agents look for ways to break the rules right they want to quote properties low so using the guide the agent's price guide as as an anchor to set your (laughs) budget for the property is just so crazy it doesn't actually reflect anything about the property does it it reflects what what the advertising um uh is trying to encourage you to do um well, yeah, they're trying to get competition. <laughs> quote it low, watch it go. Quote it high, so, watch it die. <laughs> quote it high, watch it die. <laughs> so, you know, so, yes, we often see that, that people go, oh, I'm just going to add X to the agent guide. That's really mm-hmm. unscientific. And then what it gets worse, though, the more people miss out on property, the more likely they are just going to say, oh, well, I just have to throw the kitchen sink at it. I'm just going to go to Whatever I can capacity. afford to pay, I'm going to pay it regardless of what the property is worth. Yeah, yeah that's... That's FOMO mm. at its worst. So these are crazy, unscientific, unreliable, erratic measure, you know, <laughs> methods for pricing a property. So we do not recommend So, so what's with raised your awareness of these methods? It's to perhaps encourage you not to use them. <laughs> yes. And to know that even if you're tempted, it's not the easy way out because usually what it leads to do is either getting it completely wrong yeah. or overpaying. Or, or missing or out both. constantly because you really don't know where the market is and, and what direction it's going in. Mm. So, so Veronica, um, I guess one of the, the main ways that real estate agents and buyers agents assess um, how to price a property is the comparable sales methodology. And, and that is mm-hmm. one of the valuation methodologies that valuers use. So real estate agents, buyers agents generally are not registered valuers, but they can use a similar methodology. And, and the comparable sales are um, you know, certainly something that we talk about ad nauseum in, in your first home buyer guide course and, and then within the PACE system because it uses real data and relevant recent data to assess what the general marketplace are paying for properties that are similar to the one that you're looking at. Now, there, there, there is a real method to this process um, and, and we, we go into that in quite a bit of depth. But if a market is moving in different directions, then there's also different layers that you kind of have to put on the the comparable sales methodology, isn't there? Because data that's six months old could be completely irrelevant um, if you're in a fast rising or rapidly decreasing market. And this is the thing. Okay. So You've got a bank valuation, for instance, and valuers are limited generally in that they can only use settled property. So there's a difference between a sold property and a settled property. And and the difference is that when it's sold, we call it exchange in New South Wales. Unconditional um, in Queensland. It is. There you go. So when it goes unconditional in Queensland and it goes into a settlement period in and in that time, you've paid your deposit at the beginning when you had your price you know, agreed to and terms, et cetera, et cetera, and you've exchanged contracts or whatever you've done in wherever you are to actually seal the deal and, and Put um, it under your make control. commitment mm. to buy that property. Yeah. Then you've got maybe 30 days, maybe 42 days, maybe 70 days, maybe however long that your settlement period is. And in that time is between when you've agreed on the price and when you actually pay the rest of the money. Now, valuers are generally limited to using settled yeah. property. So that's could be six weeks after the property mm. was 
you know, bought. And in a rapidly moving market, whether that market is going Mm -hmm. up or down, that means that they can be six to eight weeks, Mm. however, three months even behind the eight ball in terms of their assessment Mm. of value. So in a rising market, they're likely to be behind. And in a falling market, they're likely to actually value properties too much, too high, because they're looking at the rear vision mirror. So when you're pricing a property, you know, you really are best to use the methodology that that Megan's saying, which is comparable sales in the way that we do it. We're not limited to just use settled properties. We can use exchange properties or unconditional properties. So as soon as it's gone unconditional and the agent posted up on the website saying sold, auction result is released, yep. Then that is something you need to, to look at because the closer you can get that to the day that you're pricing up your property, the more reliable that data is. And you do need to adjust it. If it's a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, you have to be watching. And the most accurate way to do that is to say, well, if you're in an area where similar properties are selling, it's really quite easy to gauge the difference in prices because, you know, like last month, the house really similar to this sold for, you know, 10% yeah, less. Yeah. We, and, and, and we so, in buyers age, as buyers agents, we're monitoring those price changes really closely. So um, I know you and I use a similar methodology to, to have a look at, well, this is what it's worth based on the data, but this is what somebody paid. So what's the differential? What's the percentage difference? And are we seeing a consistent difference between what the data is telling us things are worth and what properties are actually selling for? And, and generally we can see a reasonably consistent and it's a good way for first-time buyers to actually monitor how quickly the market is moving. Um, and, and if you can mm. get a hold on that, that gives you a way to use the data and then add the, the premium or, or the differential to get a reasonable hold on what that property might be worth in the, today versus four weeks ago or six weeks ago or eight, eight weeks ago so that you're not overpaying but you're also not the schmuck that keeps missing out because you're constantly lowballing and everybody else is, is is well above you. So you've got to, you've got to find that fine line and, and the best way to do that is have an incredible depth of knowledge of what's actually happening in the marketplace. What a place is selling for? How does that compare to to quote ranges or asking price. And remember, you know, essentially an asking price is irrelevant. It, it is just what the owner thinks they want at the moment. And, and a quote range is just a way to gather buyers generally to a property that's advertised without a price. So they're kind of irrelevant. You've got to do your own research and arrive at your own understanding of what a property is worth in the current market, not what it was worth last year. You can't go back to that date. You can't buy any property for what it was worth last year. And you can't worry about what it might be (laughs) worth next year because no one can anticipate, you know, no one anticipated that we would be in a marketplace, you know, post COVID. Um, Well, I guess we're in the dregs of COVID, but in, you know, vaccine vaccination period COVID, where prices and buyer behaviour are doing actually what they're doing. We couldn't have anticipated that. So what you paid for a property last week, you couldn't have kind of put a premium on it and said, well, mine's going to be worth this now. Because none of us really honestly knew whether the market was going to go up, stabilise, go down. So you've got to look at today. You have to focus on today, not tomorrow, not yesterday, but today. What are, what are prices doing? How do you monitor that? You keep a very, very close check on what pro- properties are selling for. You talk to agents, you ask them questions, you get um, auction results and you start formulating an understanding of, of what direction the market's taking, how rapidly it's moving in either of those directions and you keep your own set of data. Spreadsheets are great for doing that. Absolutely. And I, look... I know that some people aren't very detailed. You know, they're more big picture. They're more like, oh, I just want a nice home. I want the feel of the place. I want it to feel good and that sort of stuff. And, you know, but unfortunately when you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars or maybe over a million dollars, particularly for your first home, you sort of have to get familiar with the detail, with the data and with the spreadsheets and actually tallying and and keeping a tab of it. It's so worthwhile because you will shoot yourself in the foot and you'll get yourself tired in knots if you don't do it. And then you're totally at the mercy of what other Mm, people suggest. Knowledge is power. It is such a powerful thing to have that knowledge that you've developed yourself that you're not relying on other people providing to you. So the sorts of people that other people listen to, you know, friends and family and, oh, God, you know, I've just come across some, oh, here's another one, Facebook groups. <laughs> oh, yes. my God. 
some of the information that is given by that people are given, you know, oh. and I, I, I put that in inverted commas, advice. <laughs> Mm-hmm. mortifying, mortifying. Mm. And, you know, so so people, you know, first home buyers in particular, you're listening to this podcast because you recognise you don't know, you know, what you don't know. And we're here because we're experienced and we know what we're talking about. We're here to help you. But there are loads of people that have no experience or they've bought one property or they, they're a bit interested or whatever, and they'll give you lots of free information and it's very, very unreliable. But when it comes to pricing a property, the sort of people that pe- that uh, buyers get um, advice from or information from are selling agents. They are other buyers. When you're at auction or mm. if there's a uh, an offer situation where the agent's telling you these other other offers, you're then taking your yes. cue from them yes. rather than actually your own research. And that in the cold, hard light of day is insane. You've got to take responsibility for this. And we've got the perfect little yes. free course for you. It's easy. <laughs> it's not, and, and it's, it, it, look, it does take time. Let's, let's, anything that you w- will do right mm. in purchasing a property will actually take time and it will take effort. And it's worth the time and it's worth the effort. Because what you actually end up with at the end of the day is, is a property that's the, the, the imperfect, perfect match for you. But you also walk away knowing that you paid the right price. You don't second guess yourself. So if you throw a dart at a dartboard or you just throw every cent that you've got at a property just to end the process, just to make it all stop, you will always be wondering if you paid too much. And you'll only really know the answer to that 10 years down the track or five, you know, hopefully not five years because you should be a longer time frame than that. But when you go to sell that property or you go to use the equity to purchase another property or to invest or whatever the case may be, that is the only time you'll really know if you paid too much and if your property has underperformed in comparison to other properties that were sold around the same sort of time. So it's it's a long time to realise that you've actually paid the wrong price if you just throw the dart if you just listen to the agents guidance if you if you listen around the water cooler if you know if if you if you're just kind of making it up as you go along if you put the effort in your peace of mind is going to be so much greater for such a longer period of time and you will know that you've paid the right price it may be a premium in a rising market but you'll have researched it and you'll have supported that um, but but in the opposite direction, I just, Veronica's mouth keeps opening to, <laughs> to, to come in here. Oh, but well, it's in a, funny. In a, you know, just as importantly is in, when things move and things go in the opposite direction, they're not as hot. You have to be on top of that because if you pay too much in a, in a market that is either stabilising or falling, then you could end up with negative equity really, really quickly. Yeah, look, it, and it does happen. The other thing that, you know, Megan was just touching on there is that, yes, in a rising market, you do have to be prepared to pay a premium. And this is the thing that sort of I bang on to my clients. It's like everyone's paying a premium everything. for everything mm. in a rising mm. market. Oh, the mm. stuff on main roads, the stuff on yeah, in flood zones, the the stuff line. on triangular yeah. blocks of land, you know stuff that needs way too much work. Everyone's got FOMO and they're going crazy. So you guys, you know, when you do this pricing research and when you actually become local experts in your own area, then you actually can start picking out, well, what's a good property versus what's not so great property? And then you can have the confidence to actually say, you know, I am going to push myself for this one. I'm going to go over, you know, what I think other people might, but you're going to have to, let's face it, only one person can buy the property and with it's the going to be the money, person with the most the money conditions. most of the time. Yeah. So, or, or, or the person who's, who's most prepared to pay the most money, I should say. And conditions are, you know, they are obviously something that makes an offer more attractive or less attractive, but you know, in a rising market, you get less opportunity to dictate, dictate um, conditions and it becomes more about the dollars, right? And so knowing that and understanding what property you could sort of lower your 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 guard down on, if you like, versus one that you should actually not go for at any price, you know, that all comes from really, really intimately knowing your market and the pricing research process is, is mm. intimately part of that, an integral part, I should say, of that 
local knowledge. So you get a lot more out of it than just purely knowing what price to pay. You get to learn how often these sorts of properties sell, you know, and, um, you know, a good one from a bad one and, and the sort of features that some buyers will pay extra for versus others, you know, those sorts of things is really invaluable um, information. And that will help you know which ones to, to pay that premium for and which ones. Yeah. And, and I, I think that you, you, you hit the nail on the head there, Veronica, people are paying a premium for, for B grade and C grade properties. And th- that, that might feel okay in this market where it's really strong, but the moment that market softens, those properties are going to have the greatest impact because people will avoid them when there's other properties, A grade properties to choose from. So, you know, one of our home buyer um, academy property principles is that if, the, if a property has an objection, if it has an issue and you can't change it, it will always be an issue. So they're the sorts yes. of things that you don't want to push yourself for. We, we purchased a property for some people um, just the other night, private treaty, just over $1.3 million. It's got a lot of work to do, but it doesn't have any ob- objections. It doesn't have any issues that can't be fixed. So it was about actually saying, well, that property that you like that's pretty and it looks nice and all that sort of stuff for 1.5, it's on a main road. It, it, it You can't fix that. You can't change that about it. But this property, it has a v- view. It's elevated. It's, you know, the, the position is really good. It needs a new roof. It needs a paint job and it needs a kitchen. How much is that going to cost? Can that fit within your budget? Yes, it can. And those objections can be fixed. So, mm, so very important, important, isn't it, to d- differentiate between what looks good and what actually is good and push yourself for the good, not the thing that looks good or feels good. That's, that's it because what, one thing that Megan and I have got, you know, over 40 years combined experience, we're old enough to be oh, mums, remember? Asleep. It's um, only 8 o'clock. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Although actually we're not really because well, maybe, probably a lot of you are actually not young enough to be. Anyway, that big degree, <laughs> I digress. Um, what I'm trying to say is that we've been around the traps. You know, when you're in, 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 in the markets in good times and bad, we know what the cycles do. We know that there's periods of time where prices are flat. We know there's pri- periods of time where prices fall. We know there's periods of time when they go mm. gangbusters like they are now. And so what this, this episode is really about pricing for changing conditions. And, you know, we know that it's only a matter of time before things will slow down again. And it's those people with uncomfortable properties, you know, the ones on the main road. Um, they didn't, in, in a slow market, there's no way in a million years people pay premium for those sorts of properties. So, you know, keeping that understanding that there are cycles and life will not always be like this, it's really critical when you're actually trying to work out what you should pay for a property and basing that on how mm, good that property could, is. Brilliant advice. Could not have said it better myself, Veronica. In this episode, we've covered a very small part of our 10-step online course for first-time buyers. If you would like to learn more about the process and how to buy without making a mistake, then head over to our website, www.homebuyeracademy.com.au. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss an episode. And if you like what you've heard today, please give us an iTunes review. Five stars would be wonderful. It will help others find us as well. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found this really useful. And if you have, please share the love with others who you know are in the same boat. We'll be back next week with some more priceless stuff. 